Retroviruses are a class of viruses, and they're called retroviruses because they do things backwards. So the, the, the notion of being retro in uh, virology is because the retroviruses have an RNA genome, so they have RNA inside the particle, and they turn that into DNA. Now, of course, cells turn DNA into RNA, and they never turn RNA into DNA. So retroviruses are kind of doing things backwards, and that's why they're referred to as retroviruses. So all retroviruses do that business, which is called reverse transcription, and they have uh, two strands of RNA, which they convert into a double-stranded DNA. And then they take that double-stranded DNA into the nucleus, and they insert it into the host's genome. So the retrovirus genome becomes part of the host genome, and therefore the cell can never get rid of that, and the only way to get rid of a retrovirus uh, is to uh, kill the cell. And so uh, that's, that's how the immune system deals with that. So there are lots of different retroviruses, lots of different species have retroviruses. Uh, they're very uh, what we call zoonotic. So retroviruses are capable of jumping from one species to another. And this is a really uh, key feature of the retroviruses. And we think that over millions of years of evolution, they've been jumping backwards and forwards from one species to another. And that leads to uh, the red queen effect, where if a virus is pathogenic, it will infect a species and then cause selection pressure on that species. So many of those uh, species members will be killed by the virus, leading to a selective pressure to become insensitive to infection from that virus. Because retroviruses are pathogenic in many cases, they lead to uh, what's called the evolution effect of the red queen effect. So a retrovirus infecting a species can cause a pathogenic effect on that species, so it will infect lots of people and um, lots of uh, species members causing selective pressure. So the ones that are most susceptible to the virus will die and the ones that are most resistant to the virus will survive. Eventually, the entire species becomes resistant to the virus. So then the virus is put under evolutionary selective pressure to change and then reinfect the species or go into another species. And so over time, the retrovirus may bounce between different species, or it may come to a species and go away and come back, leading to a kind of alternate evolution, which is termed by Lee Van Valen as the Red Queen effect. So that's one of the uh, very interesting features of retroviruses, it means that we can understand their evolution and the evolution of our cellular defenses. The human immunodeficiency viruses come from primates. So there's the most common type of HIV, is called HIV-1, that constitutes about 60 million human infections, and that is almost entirely a single event of a chimpanzee virus infecting a human, and then that virus spreading through the human population. And we know that the uh, direction is from chimpanzees to humans because the, hu the chimpanzees have more different types of the virus than humans do. Uh, there's another type of HIV called HIV-2, which comes from an African monkey called a Sudimangabe. And again, there are much more different types of this virus in Sudi Mangabe than there are in humans, telling us that the transmissions occurred from the monkey to the human. Uh, HIV-2 causes a similar disease to HIV-1 in about 20-30% of people, and most people uh, don't seem to have uh, significant symptoms after HIV-2 infection. So one of the really important questions of HIV biology, I guess, is what is the difference between this virus that has infected 60 million and these other viruses that haven't infected anywhere near that number of people? There are similar viruses in uh, primates, and in fact, most African primates have a virus that's related to the virus we have, HIV-1. And we tend to call these viruses by the species in which we find them. So the chimpanzee virus is called uh, SIV for simian immunodeficiency virus, CPZ for chimpanzee. So do chimpanzees get AIDS? That's not entirely clear. Not all chimpanzees are infected. There are certain areas where most of the chimpanzees are infected. But because chimpanzees are really not, they don't live lives like humans. So they don't live sophisticated lives. They live much tougher lives. They die much more, much younger. And it's very difficult to follow them and work out whether they have a disease. So for the longest time, we thought they really didn't suffer any disease because they don't get a really strong immunodeficiency like humans do. But more recently, we think they do get a disease, but perhaps a less severe disease. And because they don't live into old age, typically, they don't get the chance to suffer the kind of symptoms that we do. So it's, it's not entirely clear what happens to retroviral infection in uh, primates. 
In, in African monkeys, typically, the viruses do not appear to cause disease mostly, so it seems that they, there's been an adaptation perhaps of the host and the virus such that the, the monkey can be infected and not suffer disease. And they can get infected quite young, so it seems that they can have the virus in their body without significant consequences for all their lives. In other species, uh, retroviruses have really been very closely studied in mice, and that's essentially because retroviral infection in mice can cause cancer. So mice get infected by retroviruses and uh, they get typically infected with retroviruses called gamma retroviruses and it turns out that uh, retroviral infection in mice tends to cause cancer. So uh, people who were studying cancer in the uh, 50s and 60s, so very early on in this kind of work, uh, were breeding mice, inbreeding them until they became very susceptible to cancer and then were trying to work out why these mice were getting cancer and it turned out that they were getting cancer because they were getting infected by retroviruses. And these retroviruses carried genes that were termed oncogenes that were causing the cancer. And so all of the original work uh, done on retroviruses was really about understanding how cancer works and how cancer is caused. So when HIV came along and started causing immunodeficiency, that was the first time that a virus had caused that, that kind of virus had caused that kind of disease. And we knew about retroviruses through studying uh, gamma retroviruses in cancer. So retroviruses are a type of virus that you might uh, consider travels light. So uh, HIV, for example, only has nine genes and some other retroviruses only have three genes. So they really travel quite light as compared to, let's say, a herpes virus, which might have 200 genes. I think that their MO, their modus operandi, their strategy is to travel light and be quiet. So their goal is when they infect cells is not to activate the cells, not to, uh, to do too much damage. And I think that that means that they are often not, they don't cause a very strong disease uh, in the first instance, but then long-term infection can go on to cause diseases in mice like cancer, uh, although they may not really cause cancer in wild mice. It's only in the case where you knock out the mouse defences that they start causing cancer. So retroviruses are, are relatively benign viruses, I think, because they, are, they, they don't manipulate your body like uh, other viruses do. The, the main feature of retroviruses is that they, they uh, turn RNA into DNA, and, so and then they, they integrate that DNA into the host chromatin. So that's a unique feature of uh, retroviruses. Actually, a couple of other viruses do that. Uh, as an aside, but retroviruses are the only virus that absolutely depend on this uh, integration event. This cell can't get rid of them, it has to, um, it has to uh, die in order to uh, rid itself of the viral infection. So retroviruses insert their genome into the host chromatin, and so once those genes are inside the chromatin, they're there for good. And the, so the cell largely treats them as cellular genes, so they uh, are transcribed, they make an RNA, and then those RNAs are trafficked into the cytoplasm, and uh, the virus makes protein, makes viral protein, the cell makes viral proteins, and new viruses are formed, and off they go, they bud out, and off they go to infect new cells. So retroviruses are an excellent tool to study cell biology, essentially, and that's because they're simple. So some retroviruses only have three genes, uh, even a complex retrovirus like HIV only has nine genes. So it's very straightforward to uh, take that virus and split it up into bits and then study which bits do what. So there's a trick that we use, which is used in the gene therapy field, where you can take a retrovirus and take out the retroviral genes and put in the genes that you want. Then you can form retroviral particles. So you can use a trick that we use in the gene therapy field to develop what we call a retroviral vector. So the way that works is that you can take the retroviral genome that normally encodes all the retrovirus genes and you can get rid of the retrovirus genes and put in your favorite gene. So, for example, a therapeutic gene or a gene that you can easily measure. So we typically use GFP, which makes cells go green. If you do that, you can then make retroviral particles that will only infect cells and then make the protein. There's no retroviral genes in the retrovirus, so it can only make the therapeutic gene or the GFP. And that's a fantastic tool to uh, study cell biology. So for example, you can change the cell and see if the virus can still infect it. Or you can change the virus and you can see if the cell can still infect it. So you can take a genetic approach. You can work out the role of the various viral pieces of the virus to uh, get into the nucleus, to get into the cell, 
to cross the cytoplasm. So we can use retroviral vectors very easily to study cell biology and they're a fabulous tool. So you can uh, use them, for example, to uh, take cells and stop those cells making a particular gene by using RNAi. You can get retroviruses to deliver RNAi. You can use retroviruses to express a particular gene. You can use retroviruses most recently to uh, deliver CRISPR-Cas9 so that you can knock out your favorite gene in a particular cell and then you can study the effect of knocking out that gene on whatever you want to measure like cell division, cell growth, whatever the cell's doing. So they're fabulous tools uh, that you can use to study uh, how cells work. Uh, many labs are focusing on studying uh, using uh, these retroviral vectors and retroviruses in general to study innate immunity. So innate immunity or intracellular innate immunity, a type of innate immunity, is the ability of an individual cell to protect itself from viral infection. And that's quite a fascinating prospect that I think has only really recently become clear how important that is in the last uh, couple of decades. So we now understand that uh, we've been suffering an onslaught of viral infection throughout our entire evolution. And so through our evolution, we've evolved uh, very complex pathways to protect ourselves from infection. We have an adaptive immune system, of course, of T cells and antibodies, but each cell in our body also has the capacity to protect itself from viral infection. Uh, retroviruses make an excellent way to study this. So, for example, we're trying to understand how does a cell know that a virus has gone inside, that it's got in there, and it does that by a process we call pattern recognition. So there are molecules in our cells that can detect an incoming virus because they detect something that looks a bit different from a conformational perspective or from a chemical perspective. If a pattern recognition receptor sees an incoming virus, it will trigger what is referred to as an antiviral response. So several things start happening. Firstly, the cell starts making a whole bunch of proteins it wasn't making before. It starts making more of proteins that it was making, but it starts making more of them. Also starts to secrete proteins like type 1 interferons, which allow other cells that aren't yet infected to know that there's a virus coming. And so the interferons activate these uninfected cells to start making all their antiviral defenses. And this is a fantastically effective way to shut down viral replication. And because retroviruses are very simple with their nine or three genes, we can make mutations and see if they're still capable of getting past the defenses. And we can start to understand how they go about doing that.